Vision Radio Show with your host, Bonnie Clark. We stand together and accept that we now live in a world transformed by Fukushima. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on UCY.TV Radio. We relentlessly engage every ear that listens. We expose and confront the complete lack of accountability for the nuclear industry. Consider social engineering programs to view our bodies, minds, and souls as assets on a balance sheet. We discuss vital current issues, interview activists, and engage our audience in an effort to allow all voices to be heard. The Age of Vision Radio Show creates a venue that all will choose. We encourage our listeners to reclaim their power and their courage to take action and save our planet from the ravages of greed and indifference. Our actions matter. Every voice matters. We remind our listeners that happiness is resistance. Love is greater than fear. Good morning, UCY.TV radio listeners. This is Lonnie Clark with the Age of Fission radio show. Uh, thank you for joining us, and today is July 20th, 2016, and the time is 8.02 uh, Pacific Standard Time in the morning, and that is our time every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time here on ucy.tv radio and you can also find us on their youtube channel uh, ucy tv or on my channel i always uh, put a copy of this radio show on my channel also there's a playlist called the age of fission my youtube channel is called nuts for art N-U-T-Z-F-O-R-A-R-T, which is what i was before fukushima happened and i became aware that the People who are running the nuclear industry do nothing but mislead us and pollute us. Today, I have on the radio with us again someone who was like me, an average citizen, going about her life when all of a sudden a nuclear disaster dropped in her lap. And like the true professional she is, she took it on headlong square and has made a significant dent. Excuse me, dent in helping our country recover from the failed nuclear experiment. So I'd like you to welcome Donna Gilmore. Donna, thank you for the show today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yes. So uh, there is a multitude of things that I would love to talk to you about, but I always like to ask my guests, is there something on your mind that you think is urgent we need to know about or, or that you want us to know about? Uh, yes. Um, I have there, we, uh, the Department of Energy... Uh-oh, hold on, I've got a dog with a squeaky toy in here. Um, <clears throat> the Department of uh, Energy is going around and um, <clears throat> what they call consent meetings. They want to find a place to put uh, all the nuclear waste that's stored around the country, generated from reactors, Um and set up consolidated interim storage sites. They're going around the country asking people for input on uh, on this process. Now, what I've learned, I've been listening to all their meetings they're having around the country. And Thank Department you for of- doing that, by the way, for those of us that are unable to, who spend our lives working, which is why they count on us not being there. Right, that and lots of other reasons. Um, so the Department of Energy came to town here, uh, Southern California, and I met with, uh, John Kotek, who is assistant to Secretary Moniz, and one of his jobs is to lead this effort, and also, uh, with him was Andy Griffith, uh, who is the assistant deputy to Kotek, and he's... He's the manager that's responsible um, for the 
for the this nuclear waste project. Hmm. Um, what I learned from meeting with them in a semi-private meeting is neither of them were aware that the thin, mostly half-inch stainless steel nuclear waste canisters that are each holding a Chernobyl's worth of cesium, highly radioactive cesium, uh, that they couldn't be inspected. I thought people like that, since their specialty is nuclear waste management, is one of their key functions, would know this. Do you not think they are doing their usual lying straight to your face about it? No, no, no. I... Uh, not at all. Not at all. Uh, they wow. see this, uh, John Kochek, um, I'm, I'm pretty good at picking up BS. All right? Yeah, so, you are. So, wow. Yeah. Maybe I learned, more maybe stuff. I learned that from dating. I'm not sure. But anyway, I've gotten really good at it. <laughs> but that's actually <laughs> even more stunning, Donna. Think well, you, that. well, you just, just, uh, so anyway, so John Kotek, they see that as the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's responsibility to do their job. And, and uh, you can see John Kotek has like 10 major areas he's responsible for. So he's a super high level, you know, executive manager. And so, you know, it was kind of like, well, you know, that's the NRC's doing that part. It's like, so he didn't have to worry about that part. He could just see it in his head. And then, and then, uh, Andy Griffith, who is actually a former submarine uh, nuclear engineer, um, he, he said to me, he said, no, that's impossible. They have to be inspected. So he, he was, he, and he kept repeating that. No, that can't be true because they have to be. That can't be true because they have to be. He kept repeating that over and over. And I finally managed to break through because he he initially had this attitude like, oh, you know, he's this expert, so he, you know, yeah. knows everything. Yeah. And I, man I managed to break through because I have the evidence, I have the facts, and I and I seem to be able to talk to people at, at that high levels and well, have them, you, that's you know, what understand. You did, for, you did, you were in a high level position yourself for all of your career, so you identify with their thought processes, that's what I think, and you are extremely effective at it. Well, you know, I, you know, I worked with uh, people that worked directly for elected officials and appointed people, so that was a big part of my career, so of working in those circles, too, so from all walks of life. But um, so anyway, we, uh, I ended up having an extra private meeting with just the two of them. We kind of had this semi-private semi meeting with some local uh, folks. And when I told him that the Coburg nuclear plant has a container, it's a water tank, but the NRC considers it comparable to our canisters that store spent fuel in the United States, um, that it leaked in only 17 years, and, it, and the cracks were deeper than the thickness of our canisters. Uh, that stopped him cold because the vendors have been putting out the BS and, the, and some of the NRC managers, they've been putting the BS out. Oh, you don't have to, these will last a hundred years or more. You know, you don't have to worry. And, and so with, could, and I'm could finding. You, could I ask you to explain what you just said a little, in a little bit more detail about the canister leak, about the type of leak there was that flipped him out? That the okay. The, yeah. The um, the these the thin canisters that are used in the United States they haven't been in use uh, long enough for them to start leaking. The, the way the pro with the properties of stainless steel um, pressurized containers they call them uh, welded containers is they the stainless steel layer can. Um, if it's breached, it's very fine film. If that is, is breached, pitting, corrosion, salt, moist salt, air, various things can cause that to fail. They will start cracking. And the nature of stainless steel is once a crack starts, it continues to grow on its own, unabated, through the wall of the canister. And then when you get all the way through, then, then it will leak. So because they haven't been in use long enough to have any actual experience, the NRC looked at other similar containers, similar components used at other nuclear plants to get some idea, operating experience they call it, on how long they're going to last. 
And the Coburg plant had this water tank that it cracked all the way through. It did not have nuclear waste in it, so they didn't have a radioactive release with that. But the materials and the way it's made, they consider, the NRC considers it a, in a comparable container to our nuclear waste canisters. And I've uh, shared this story with, uh, with um, uh, material engineers that, that inspect nuclear uh, parts and reactors and, and design containers for recognized. I've shared this, this information, and they were shocked. They were absolutely shocked. Uh, about this. Because they really... trusted the NRC to do their job 100% professionally and correctly, scientifically. Well, they, they did not have the, ex- the experience to know, you know, how, and, and here's the thing, that covert tank, it was at a- ambient temperatures. Again, it, 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 it failed in only 17 now, years. Where now, is the covert tank? Where is, it, where... it's in, it's located in South Africa. Um, uh, it's uh, right by the ocean, similar to the San Onofre one, similar to Diablo Canyon, similar environment. And what caused that to fail was moist salt air. I don't know if you did live near the ocean. You, you mm-hmm. can see how <clears throat> salt air corrupts metal. It does the same thing as thing with steel. And so this particular case, it was due to the salt air. But, you know, the salt, moist salt air isn't the only thing that can cause these things to fail. But that, so <clears throat> anyway, so based on the information that I provided to, to them, uh, Andy Griffith met with his DOE staff and they, they, uh, they already had stress corrosion cracking. That's what it's called. Chloride induced stress corrosion cracking. It means, it means it's cracking due to salt air. They already had that on their list of what they call technology gaps, which means things they haven't solved, basically. <laughs> Um, Great. And and so they moved it up in priority. Okay. So they've changed the priority. They see that's a bigger problem than they thought. And I said, okay, Andy, you can move it up in priority, but even if you find the cracks, even if you find a way to, to or, you know, or even if you can find cracks, and even though you raise this up in priority, what are you going to do if you have cracks? How are you going to fix them? You, you know, I said the... The uh, the manufacturer president, uh, Dr. Singh, he's the president of Holtec, one of the major U.S. manufacturers of these thin canisters. He admitted that even if you could find the cracks, even a microscopic through wall crack will release millions of series of radiation into the environment. And even if you could find a way robotically to repair the crack, which they don't have, it you, it'll just introduce another rough surface that can trigger more cracking. So he does not recommend, even if you could, attempting to repair these types of containers. So what do you so do? What the heck, yeah, so what the heck, you know, these are, you're talking a million dollars, you know, one to four million dollars. Can't they uh, build for, a container around the containers? Can't they just, like, go out there and pour something thicker, a lot thicker, over the dirt and then build a wall around the dirt and build another one and have this big, gigantic, massive container that at least protects the environment? Well, here, are you talking about after there's a leak? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I mean, you can't move it. That's what I hear you saying. Once there's a leak, there's no moving it, right? Well, what, what, the, what the vendors are telling Andy Griffith and, and other people, um, they're telling them they'll, they'll, they'll do a Russian doll thing. They'll take one. Yeah. They'll, they'll take a leaking thin canister and put it in, inside what they call an overpack. Okay, which is just basically a thick metal um, cask that the thin one would sit in yeah. to. And I told Andy, I said, well, I said, well, how are you? I said, I talked to the NRC director of spent fuel management. His name is Mark Lombard. Um, and, I, and I said, Mark, I'm not aware of any, any uh, casks that are approved for this purpose. And he told me, well, there, that's because there aren't any, and nobody has even brought it up in discussion as something they plan to do. So this, this, the vendors are throwing out a solution and telling the utilities this is the solution, telling the DOE this is the solution, but they, have, they don't have such a thing. Not even and the vendor? Any, the vendor hasn't even created the solution? No, no. 
No. Why hasn't anybody at least come? I mean, in all the money that they're like, this is what I don't understand. On a, it's incomprehensible that the NRC would be so grotesquely incompetent. Well, all points lead to Mark Lombard. Mark Lombard is the NRC director of the Spent Fuel Management Division. He is responsible final approval for licensing of storage and transport of nuclear waste. He is the person. So, and I asked Mark, I said, Mark, why are you approving these thin canisters that you know can't be inspected and that can crack and leak, you know, that aren't going to last? Why are, why are you, and they can't be monitored. So we will only know after it leaks radiation into the environment. They have no early warning system to, to stop it before it happens. I said, why? I said, you know these are going to have to sit here for decades or indefinitely. Um, you know, there's no Yucca Mountain. There's no, you know, permanent repository on the horizon now. Everybody, everybody acknowledges that, even the NRC. Why do you still approve these, you know? And he tried to tell me, oh, well, you know, it's policy. I said, you know, I said, I know, well, I know, what, I know what policy means. It means somebody made that up. So I said, well, who set that policy? And then he said he did. <laughs> and why did he do that? Then I, I asked why. He says, well, you know, if I stick with these, these thin canisters, um, then I can get the vendors to do all the research and development. I don't have to pay for that. And do you know they will even pay for my staff's time when we meet with them? It's all about his friggin' budget. Did he really say that? Yes, he did. I wish you had that, on, I wish you had I, that on recording the next I, time. You know, we were having lunch. He invited me to, this was back in 2004, he invited me to be a speaker at their annual nuclear waste conference. Wow, um, that's so a crime I, against humanity. That is just pure greed. Well, and but, but so okay, we we see the problem now. That how how do you get the problem fixed? So I'm all about solutions. Okay, uh, uh, and so when I met with John Kotak, I met, you know the DOE. I assume that they all knew this stuff. You know, we all do. We assume they know it, and they're just you know, corrupt or on the table, you know, whatever reason you want to come up with that would motivate these people. But he truly did not know. And you're going to, you're going to find this story interesting. Uh, former chairman McFarland um, was at this uh, public meeting we had when the DOE came to town. And in her presentation, she was talking about, you know, how all the containers are about the same. And, that told me she hadn't read the email I sent her with the proof otherwise. So at the break, I happened to end up standing in line behind her in the women's restroom, okay? Mm. So some people have two-minute elevator talks. <laughs> Mine was in the restroom. So I introduced myself. She thanked me for the email that I'd sent her a few days ago, but it was obvious from her presentation she hadn't read it or believed it. So I said, you're aware um, that, this is McFarland, I said to her, so you're aware of these canisters, these thin canisters can't be inspected. She says, what are thin, what are these thin canisters everybody's talking about, you know? So they're used to referring to these differently than that terminology. Um, hmm. I, didn't, I didn't tell her I basically reframed how you refer to these things. No one was aware that these canisters are half inch thick. I mean, virtually no one, maybe the NRC, but nobody else was aware that these things were that thin. Or that vulnerable, that they only had a 20 year shelf life before they started to crack. And then, or leak, not crack, leak. They can crack them much sooner. They can crack, start cracking much sooner than that. Um, But, um, (laughs) so, but what I learned is the, the rest of the world is not as, nuts as we are here, um, and they use uh, a different technology using uh, thick metal casts that are 10 to almost 20 inches thick. So we have a half inch, they have 10 to almost 20 inches thick metal, okay? Wow. That's the difference. Okay, and, wow. and, and so 
the reason well, they that also we warn really- their people when they're going to clean. They also send out warnings when they're doing their annual inspections and cleaning that releases a lot of the radiation. They they actually put out community service notices that say keep your kids inside, stay inside for the next two weeks. We're cleaning out the nuclear power plant. Big releases of nuclear radiation are going to be exposed. Uh-huh. Don't worry about it after two weeks, which is kind of annoying in itself, but at least they warn people. <laughs> in America, they just aggregate the cost. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so it, it, at any rate, so McFarland was in disbelief that that what I said could be true, that they can't be inspected. Once I told her, you know, I, I just explained what a thin canister was. And then I told her, I said, well, you know, the thick cast, and that's my term. I didn't tell her I made up these terms, but the terms have kind of been used nationally now. So, great, um, thank you. And, and and so yeah, I've reframed the message. Well, that's what I we need to, to do. Actually, that's precisely exactly what needs to happen. We need to right. change the language. We need to actually speak truth. It's, I mean, they're using all these acronyms and not informing each other. I mean, that is so. Since McFarlane left, has the? I mean, I know she. Ironically, well, let, let me let me just let me just finish this story with her because okay. it's very informative. Please. Remember, she was the former chairman. Mark Lombard was in the chain of command to her, and and I explained to her that the thick casts you can get close to them, so you can inspect them. And before I said any more, I saw the light bulb go off, and she says, "Oh, that's right. The the the, the thin canisters have to." I'm paraphrasing. The thin canisters have to be in the concrete overpacks because they, they don't provide radiation protection because it's, you know, so thin. So she finally understood that they would have a hard time accessing the canister to even be able to inspect even the outside. So, you know, and so, but, but so what I find out on this Donna, day, Donna, can I just, uh, I've seen the diagram on your, I'm going to, that, is it really that's the amazing part there's no method i see that that canister sits inside something it like a little egg shell right but when there's a any problem with it they can't lift that out and look at it, it provides- no no you can't i need to kill you if you got close to it yeah it doesn't the thin canister doesn't protect from gamma rays or neutrons um, and so when they, when they, what they, the only thing they've been able to do, they did this at Diablo with a couple of canisters and a couple of other places, is they, there's air vents. Okay, the thin canister sits in a concrete overpack, either a horizontal or a vertical container that it sets into. And then it has a lid on it. And the lid, there's air vents around the lid because the canisters are so hot the heat has to be able to dissipate, so they have air vents um, in the uh, in there. And I have a picture on my website. You'll see men up on a uh, some kind of a crane, and they they're staying below the air vents, and they put some kind of little robotic tool through these air vents. They weren't designed for this purpose, by the way. And they and they scraped off the uh, some of the dust particles on parts of the, of the surface of the canister that they could reach, and they checked those to see if there was any corrosive particles that would be corrosive to stainless steel, which they did find. On where, they, where is that on your page? That's sananofreesafety.org. Sananofreesafety.org. If, if you go down a bit, you'll, it's a, if you search for, do a page search on for Diablo, or you just scroll down, you'll see a couple of men, uh, you know, uh, on some, some kind of a, oh, a yeah, screen. collecting yeah. dust samples at Diablo Canyon. Yeah, right, right. And they also use some kind of tool to take the temperature around parts of the canister. The NRC had no idea how hot these canisters would be after a couple of years, and they were shocked to learn that in in only two years, that canister is a two year old canister. It's only been loaded with fuel for two years. It, it, the temperature was already low enough for, for moisture to stay on the canister long enough to dissolve salt on the surfaces, which is what will trigger the cracking process, the two-year-old canister. The NRC had told me, this was in July of 2014, that the canisters would be so hot, no moisture would be able to stay on the canister 
so 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 nothing would go wrong for at least 30 years and they were dead wrong about that and they've been hiding the information about Diablo Canyon ever since then Mark Lombard has avoided sharing that information with people and he has misled I have watched him mislead he tried he tried it with me and as I was making my my presentation in um, November 2014 and you can see it on my home page I have I have that um presentation there Mm -hmm. and when I had in my slide presentation where I said the canisters could be inspected he turned to me and you can see it on camera he turned to me and says oh Donna that's not true I just don't have time to go into it now but he was lying on camera then I have another presentation of him also on the home page where he was speaking in front of the California Coastal Commission and one of the commissioners who knew these canisters can't be inspected because I had managed to get their commission staff to put it in their staff report to the commissioners so they had the information. Donna, uh, why? 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 Why is he irretractable? Why Why is he in this position of denying evidence, essentially? Well, um, you know, one of the things he says to me, he says, Donna, I don't know why you worry about this. You know, they, they'll figure out all these. They, they'll always figure it out. They'll figure out problems. There won't be a the nuclear worry too much. The nuclear priesthood. He believes exactly. in the nuclear priesthood. Um, yeah, unsubstantiated hope, you know. And I said, what are you talking about? Look at, I said, look at Hanford. He's got leaking tanks. Look at Savannah River. Look at Whip is, 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 is there so-called flagship uh, geological repository is closed after 15 years from plutonium leaking out into the environment as as these drums, these thin drums explode. Um, you know, and he goes, oh, well, that's the DOE. We're a lot better than them. That was his comment, you know. So, and, wow. and anyway. So, yeah, this is, this is the, we've got, the, the thing is, if you, if, if you want to get promoted at the NRC, I mean, I, they have a lot of good. They have a lot of good technical people at the NRC, but you know, the management makes the decisions, not the working level people. The managers make the decision, and they have um, what's called a safety culture problem at the NRC, where people can be afraid to speak up for fear of retaliation. I mean, you know, they were audited for this. I have a a, a section under issues on my website about. Um, um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have a special uh, section just for them, and it talks about the safety, safety allegations. Problems. You mean that one? Uh, no, actually, it's an NRC problem. I made a whole separate one just for them. Safety allegations is the safety allegations is mainly about employees working at utility plants uh, and other places that are retaliated against for reporting safety problems. I've There's never explored this. Ch- I've explored a lot, of, but this one really is amazing. And you have uh, GAO audits, USA Senate NRC oversight, California Energy Commission. This is bravo. Thank you. This is really, uh, honestly, let's click on the NRC problems because this is my question, though. How is it not, they get a billion dollars a year? <laughs> Well, you know, okay, if, you know, you always follow the money. The money, their budget has to be approved by the Senate. The Senate controls their budget. The Senate, the Senate basically is pro-nuclear, and I doubt if the people there know the problems, know the, the risks. I mean, who are they listening to? Barbara um, Boxer not, must know, don't you think? Well, she Barbara, Barbara Boxer knew about San Onofre, all right? She had the evidence on San Onofre. So with, when Barbara Boxer has the awareness, she's great. She's great. But I tried to explain to her staff her, her uh, when she was uh, chair of whatever that um, Senate Oversight Committee is over the NRC, um, I tried to explain to her staff about the canisters, but... Um, but she's she's believing information from other sources, and it was it wasn't open to you know hearing um, the facts. And unfortunately, 
Um, unfortunately, the, the Union of Concerned Scientists has been promoting using these thin canisters because of their concern about the pools are so bad. But unfortunately, they never really uh, did analysis on the canisters um, to understand the problems with them. I read that letter from Mark Lombard, and he says that he thinks that there's a greater threat from a terrorist attack, or what he say, earthquakes, then it's more of a threat than that, than th- because moving these, the canisters are so heavy, they might get dropped. So, uh, oh, you're talking about a lock bomb. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, the Union of Concerned Scientists. Yeah, you know, he, here's the thing. Mar- uh, uh, I mean, I like Gabe Lockbaum, and I, and I think he has good intentions, and he does a lot of good work. Uh, but on this issue, um, uh, it, we're, we're not in, in step on this issue. This is, um, you know, fundamentally it's because people don't believe that nuclear pollution is that deadly. No, I no, think, that's I not the that's no, good. that's not the reason. No, he, um, uh, you know, they saw. Uh, you know, he and Gordon Thompson went and toured some old. Um, I forget which one it was. Spent fuel pool, and they saw all this, <clears throat> this. They saw this stuff falling apart, sitting at the bottom of the pool, and they were just shocked. You know, so uh, <clears throat> and, and so they've been on this quest to to Do get fuel out of pools. Do you think that they will at some point be considered whistleblowers if they change their stance on this? No, 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 not 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 at all. Uh, not, not at, at all. all. I, I think you know they've spent how many years has it been? I don't know. I don't know how many years. How many days? Over a decade, telling everybody to get it out of the pools and put it in these canisters. They didn't care. They didn't care which ones that you mm. put it in. They didn't care. They just but trusted it, that it was safe, that the NRC did their job and recommended the well, correct I think, canister. I don't think they, no, I don't think it's that they trusted the NRC to do their job. I think they just, they didn't, They. I don't know where they got their research or if they did research on the quality of these containers. I mean, Gordon Thompson wrote a report that, said that the, the castor, which is the thick German one that was at the time, it was just under 15 inches thick, they said he would recommend that. However, if these thin canisters prove to last, that they will last 100 years, then he would recommend those. So he actually recommended the, 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 the thick metal cast, which the rest of the world uses, but then he said, you know, maybe these thin ones would be good enough if they're proven to last. So he had a qualifier in that, okay? Mm. But he's not even listening to his own qualifier right now. And and then with Lockbaum, I sent an email to him. He he wrote a letter endorsing these thin Poltec canisters um, that recommended the Coastal Commission give them a permit to install close to 100 more of these and even... And it's even worse than the others, but that's another story. Uh, so I wrote to Dave. I said, Dave, how can you recommend these things? You know, they're, you know, because of the cracking, et cetera, et cetera. And he really never responded to that issue. He said he's worried about terrorists and, and other things, but he never responded to the fact that these things could prematurely crack and leak. He just ignored that part, which was my main point to him he, he never addressed it yeah, but this, says, is, well, Donna, this is where I believe that these people are malicious I honestly in my heart of hearts I think they are just maliciously greedy people who know that they have created such massive pollution that it is going to be ecocide in 50 60 70 100 years and they're just going to deny 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 yeah i i yeah no i i don't i really don't think that of dave i mean I, you know i mean he's he's dug in on the issue that's important to him and he's willing to just hope for the best uh, that that we won't have a problem with these thin canisters. That, that they're going to really... find a solution. That don't worry. The nuclear scientists know this is urgently needed, and we're going to come up with something really great that'll s- save the planet. Yeah, I, it's you know, which is what I it's called. I call it unsubstantiated hope. This 
I think there was a New York attorney. I that, called it delusion. Now, if yeah. we, have, we have about 20 minutes left, and I hope yeah. that you don't mind if I switch gears a little bit since we're I, I just wanted to close with one, one thing. I'm, I'm still working with um, the Department of Energy because as I educate them, they, they talk to vendors, and the vendors come back with some line of BS that I know how to counter because I've heard it all. And so I'm continuing to work with him. The DOE, Andy Griffith, he's been very respectful. He's, he, he sees that I'm not your typical, you know, citizen activist or whatever you want to call it. And so I, you know, I seem to have credibility with them. So I'm continuing to work with him. We're going to have another uh, uh, phone meeting um, after he's done traveling. So we'll see how far I can get. But I think the takeaway here is don't assume that your leaders, do not assume that the decision makers know what we know. Because what I've found is they don't. And they won't necessarily, anything you write, they will just reject because they think they already know. So, so this is going to take one-on-one personal conversations to get their attention and evidence, hard evidence, and the evidence has to come from the, the NRC or, or some scientific lab that they respect. And the, we have all the evidence we need. It's just getting it to the decision makers and, and you know, developing that rapport and credibility. And then hopefully they have the you-know-what that they will do the right thing. But uh, So now, what you're <laughs> suggesting is that we should make an effort to get in touch with the Senate at the Environment and... I mean, I think there's a committee, Environment and Oversight Committee. Is aren't they the ones that they handle that? Well, you know, they don't really have. You know, when Bar- Barbara Boxer was in charge of that, um, she, you know, she she had a voice, but she didn't have any authority. Right. You know. That. So right, they know, even so refused to give her documents. They just well, you know, so well. and she's only one. She's only one senator. So we need a lot more of them educated. Now, some of them I don't even know if they're you know open to, to hearing the truth. Some of them will tend to believe whatever the vendors tell them or the nuclear industry tells them. Mm-hmm. It'll be their word against ours or something like that. You know. So, but but I managed to be able to get through. But the thing is that what I'm trying to do is educate more people on this issue. I've got all the information on the website, hopefully in a user in a friendly format. <clears throat> and the, the next layer, the next step has to be, uh, I'm going to have to do another document. When, when, when this information I put out about the non-inspecting and all of this other stuff, they, the industry comes back with different BS solutions. And I have counters to all those, but I think I need to make a document that, puts all the counter to all these things they're going to come up with because I've got people around the country trained for the first level and and I tell them to always cite your sources. It's not Donna Gilmore saying this. This is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission right. saying this, you know. Um, so you have to cite those so-called credible sources. Um, but, the next, but then they also need to know the BS that the nuclear industry is putting out and the vendors and know how to counter that. So that's the next stage. But but just don't assume that the decision makers are understand this. So I'm you know, I'm willing to work with anybody that wants to put in, you know, the time and effort to to help in their area of the country on this issue. Um, because we need more than uh you know, more people that can message this and, and do this. Um, so, but yeah, don't assume that they know this stuff, but well, we don't have you, a lot of time this is the, to deal with it. Yes. And so how do we coordinate our, this is the one thing I have, uh, become acutely aware in the last year of, uh, being on the radio and focusing my attention to the nuclear, uh, re- industry and the, really the, oversights i don't mean the negligence i don't know i i call it gross negligence on on every step of the way i mean it's just stunning and as you're pointed out is that many of these people just don't know many of the elected officials who make decisions but we also have a community of people who are disconnected like when i first got into this three years ago when i became aware like i told you before i thought san onofre all my life was an observatory owned by the navy i had no idea 
it was a nuclear power plant. And so I really am super new to this. And I thought there wasn't that many people because I just couldn't find them. I, you know, I, I tried to look and there was a few, but they seemed off in the distance. And honestly, it took me kind of a windy road to find it. But I've discovered that there's lots of sm- Anytime there's a nuclear power plant, there's a community of people who are actively, or any kind of nuclear anything, there are people because of the negligence and because of the misinformation that our elected officials are getting. Now, is it worth it for us to say contact John Barrasso, who is the head on the, what's the committee, is the environment and, uh, you know, what's the name of this uh, com- is Environment and Public Works Committee? He's the person who oversees, John Barrasso is the person who oversees the energy and natural resources. Wouldn't he be the guy to yeah, talk and to? And where, at what level is this? This is at the Senate. Oh, you're talking to the federal government? Yes, didn't you tell yeah. us that, that, that those are the people that don't, uh, that are controlling the budget? Because this is what we're talking about here in uh in the you know in St. Louis for example that's one of the big issues there they have a house budget that's stuck uh the people who are controlling the budget the fuse wrap budget is going smaller 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 to manage nuclear waste is rolled into a a lot Th- this is an interesting statement here i'm sorry to convolute it but uh i do understand that the waste used by the Department of Energy and the waste from the nuclear power plants are probably relegated differently, correct, Donna? Um, well, the, the, there, are, there are a number of differences. Um, Different, however, yes. however the, so, you know, I've, one thing I've learned is I've, I've studied um, the nuclear waste leaks that are happening at Hanford and Washington and with Savannah River, to, you know, what they all have in common, they're using thin wall metal containers hmm. that cannot be adequately inspected, and they only know after they leak radiation. You know, it's a, a similar theme all throughout. Wow. You know, so, it, so and, and, and getting it, I've reached, I haven't been involved with the Department of Energy that long. I mainly was dealing with the, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the commission or the state. But as I get into it, it, what I see is the Department of Energy trusting these vendors to the point that the Department of Energy actually has Holtec, one of the vendors, right, uh, is part of the group that wrote their report for their pilot consolidated interim storage project. And they, t- they take it at face value. They just trust what it, what's in there is correct. They trust that the NRC is doing their job, so they don't have to worry about it. I mean, you know, so, uh, you know, a lot of it leads back to Mark Mark Lombard at the NRC, because he, he even has to approve uh, DOE containers for DOE-managed sites. Wow. And, you know, you know Mark, and, and I don't know, if, if Mark was gone, I, I don't know if they're going to put somebody else just like him, but um, something that Dave Lockbaum had told me, once, and um, in fact, I even have it on the website somewhere, that when the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was really doing their job, putting safety over profits, that the one of the key senators at the time uh, said, hey, if you don't start playing nice with the nuclear industry, we're going to cut your budget 40%. Wow. Because they were getting kickbacks, no doubt, from the nuclear industry. Well, I'm, I, you know, so, no doubt. I, you know, the thing is that whether, whether, you know, I think you've got, you've got two kinds of people. There, there, you know, you could have senators that if you, if, if you can educate them, well, maybe three kinds. You got senators that you can educate with facts and they will listen. Um, but you have some. Um, that they're they're going to filter out whatever you say and just trust the nuclear industry. They're not going to listen. Kind of, Sen- Senator Feinstein in California is a good example. She totally is trusts the nuclear industry, you know. And there's just there's just no opening her brain, you know. She's kind of like, you know, I mean, 
I see. See, Hillary is is also Hillary Clinton. She's also super pro nuclear. Uh, yeah, she's she's doubled down on it. Her her campaign website has, has even strong. So she she won her the, I we have fifteen minutes, and I am just I'm going to veer off of this very rapidly okay. because you're top brought up Hillary Clinton. I honestly, Donna, I hope that we have every single person who's a Democrat calls up the, their, their super delegate, and you can find them out, call their offices and say, we voted for Bernie Sanders. We are not going to let the DNC steal our votes. If every super delegate that Bernie Sanders won in that state, we would have Bernie Sanders as our nominee, fair and square. If the super delegates went with Bernie, we would have Bernie Sanders, and he, we as a we're hearing things of oh my gosh, we can't have Trump, we can't have Clinton. You know what? Both are two sides of the same fascist coin. They will do nothing but harm our country. This is how I sincerely feel, and the world. And I really believe if our citizens. Anybody listening to this radio show, at least, if you're a Democrat, call up, look up your super delegates online, like I did, find their phone numbers and say, you know what, I am not ever going to vote for you or another Democrat again if you stab us in the back and steal this election. Asking me to vote for Hillary Clinton is like stealing my car and demanding I fill up the tank so you can get away. I am not doing it. You need to vote for Bernie Sanders in the convention. So we will have Bernie Sanders as the nominee, and we can beat Donald Trump, hands down. No problem. I know well, any okay. Republicans who would vote for him. Yeah, here, here's, the, here's your thing. Bernie is already endorsing Hillary, so that... Well, he had to Trump. endorse her. He had to, or they were not going to yeah. let him in the convention. So we can yeah. still... They, can, they are bullying us. And they are well, you know, yeah. here, here's, a, here's another thing. I mean, I have, you know, I've not been involved with the, with the Green Party at all. Um, Me either, I, but I re-registered as I did a Dem exit. I'll tell you what, the day he well, endorsed her, I was pretty livid. <laughs> well, so what I did is, you know, I, most people, people that are voting for Hillary have never even read her campaign website, all right? True, and you have these pro these anti nuke people that don't even know that she was supporting nukes. They didn't even know that even after eight years as a New York senator, she supported keeping Indian Point open, even though it's friggin' leaking radiation from the pools, you know, into the in in the ground, and and continues to break down because of the aging parts and missing bolts. And she still supports keeping it open when you know when it would take out Manhattan if it failed. I mean, this is the the, the non, you know, this is the craziness there. But so what I did, I went and looked at um, all. uh, I looked at uh, Trump's website doesn't even mention the word nuclear. Hillary supports more nuclear plants. Mm -hmm. Um, I looked at Jill Stein's uh, campaign web page recently, and my goodness, if you voted, if I was to vote based on platform. She, I mean, everything she has on her website, whether she can accomplish it or, or work to accomplishment, I, you know, I don't know. But everything that she has down there, she has a lot of the Bernie stuff and more. You know, she even is stronger against mm-hmm. nuclear. So if, you, if I suggest everybody go and read her platform and tell, then, then you can tell the Democrats, if you, if you don't want me voting for Jill Stein, your platform better look like this one. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing about the Green Party, and this is interesting. In our country, the Green Party has been seriously demonized. Horribly, they're like, oh, well, you guys just want everything for free. You just, no, we don't want everything for free. It's just that we build, believe in building a society where we take care of the elderly and the poor. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's a, we have, we have homeless people in our country, and we have veterans. That soldier who killed those, as, police officers he was what we're not talking about is his mental disability that he got from being in the service i mean sending our soldiers overseas to fight in a war that means nothing except greed is outrageous and we're doing it as a standard practice i mean there is no conversation about ending any of that except from bernie sanders 
Frankly. Well, you know, whether... whether and Jill Stein, it, and Jill Stein. But, but it, you know, forget that, it, forget that it says Green Party. I'm just saying people should go and read her platform right. and see if they agree with it. If they agree with it... And listen to her you know, speak that, and that, that, that's what she is. What's that? Listen to her speak and understand that she is capable of managing that position. Yeah. Now, my experience with the Green Party in the past, locally is they were really just focused on getting more members and they I didn't really see them the people actually active on issues and the Green Party didn't even didn't even have an anti nuclear position in their previous uh platform statement. So I was not happy with them at all. Uh you know, and it's kinda you know, like Trump. I, he doesn't say anything about nuclear at all. But you know, let's be let's face it, he's pro, pro, pro nuclear. He says clean energy. We want to get America great again. I guarantee you he's gonna be super pro nuclear. I mean, it's I I really think that we need to really stand up that we're on a precipice right now and frankly I'm not sure that the Democratic Party would allow if there was I read an article Donna yesterday that said they're expecting 10 million Bernie supporters at the convention. Do you think that's true? You're part of you've been part of that. I I I know there are a lot of people going. It'll be be more like a protest, I'll tell you, you know. Well, um, I still I mean, think we the, have a the Bernie, the, chance. Bernie, the Bernie people are about the, the platform, are about, you know, what, 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 what we stand for. And we don't like the platform as it is, and we, well, and we won't support the platform as it is. So, Yeah, um, well, this is, it's the election fraud. That's been the, that's been, for me, that's the turning point. I cannot vote for, if she had been the winner outright, and really won by a chinny chin chin and most of everybody in the elections had gone off without a snag and we would have had debates I could support her as a candidate but the way this thing has just been jimmy rigged people votes don't count votes are not counted votes are shredded the super delegates purchased before the election uh uh-uh. uh I'm not, that's not a party I want to support. Let's just be clear. That is not a party. I, if if by chance they don't commit suicide, that's what I think they're doing is committing suicide. If they nominate Hillary Clinton, to, frankly, if I don't think I don't think she can be. I don't think she can beat Trump. I really don't. She cannot beat Trump. Not in the slightest. And you know what? Like, everything, it, it's just ridiculous for the uh, Democratic Party to keep insisting that this well, is Well, you, you know, I probably shouldn't say those things. Because I, I basically, I try and stick to the facts and, and make my case based on facts. So that, you know, that is I just think that's pretty sense. factual. Every poll. Yeah. There's only it, been a few well, polls, you know, unless he shoots him. See, I kind of have this secret theory that Trump's in it to make her look like a dove. He picks always, he always offends the Democrats. He does every, he needs our votes to get our elected. So why would he every time pick the, he picks the most offensive uh vice presidential candidate he shoots himself he was ahead after every he comes out and says the most obviously bigoted things in the world and you know it's he's kind of normalizing this is i heard somebody at the convention last night they said he says what needs to be said really he needs to say that people are less than he needs to say that uh, there are certain people in society that aren't as good as others. That's what I hear him say. Well, you know, um, I know, I know. When when I was doing the Bernie volunteer work, we had a lot of the, uh, we had a lot of minorities that are they are afraid that if Trump gets that. I mean, and you know, they came out to help with this. So this, well, this I'll be honest out, with Mike Pence. I'm afraid of him. He is the one congressman. His office falsely reported that I threatened to murder his staff after I called his office and said I disagreed with his vote against un- him not uh, not reinstating the unemployment benefits. I got investigated by the Eugene Police Department because of Mike Pence's office, the culture in his congressional office, so that if anybody called up and said, hey, your vote to uh, not reinstate those unemployment benefits might cause someone in New York City to freeze to death this winter. I hope you rethink that. 
That is what I said, Donna. They called up and reported that I threatened to murder their staff. Sergeant Donica here in Eugene, Oregon, investigated me for several days before contacting me because he couldn't figure out why. There was nothing on that. So I, you talk about scared of pants. Well, it, so- it sounds like they play dirty pool, really. Well, it's a standard really, practice. Really bad. It's a standard well, see, you know, this, this is the reason they want us to vote for Hillary, and this is the reason Bernie... Uh, Look, says we got to have Hillary because because Trump is so uh, awful it would be no, much worse. We got to have him. Bernie. We have got to insist that the Democrats refuse to allow our election to be stolen. We have super delegates to keep it from being stolen. We can insist our super delegates go into that convention and give their vote with whoever their state voted. Well, for. well right, well, right now the only, right now maybe I'll change my mind, but right now the only way I would vote for a Hillary ticket is if Bernie was on the ticket. I'm never voting for Hillary. I'll just be yeah. clear. I would not ever, under a million years, if Bernie goes on the ticket, he he is meaningless to me. I would vote Jill Stein because she, in my view, is a lying thief that we saw steal the nomination at the bare minimum. Nobody's even talking about Seth Rich, the DNC staffer who mysteriously was murdered at 4 o'clock in the morning, four times in the back when he was about to give his report on the election fraud. I, I am just livid over the fact that no one's talking about that this kid mysteriously died right before he was about to give his report to the DNC on election fraud. It has subsequently come out that 15% of the votes in California were flipped for Hillary that were meant for uh, Bernie. So I, no way. Well, I would, there's, there's, a, there's definitely, I've never, this is the first year I've seen a problem in California, but it was rampant. People, uh, we were uh, we were doing this door to door campaign, and people would come. Uh, volunteers would come to my house to get uh, you know areas they were assigned to. I couldn't believe how many people said I couldn't vote this morning because it wasn't open or they didn't. And then others were asked right. later on. I hear, oh, they ran out of Democratic ballots, and and then then they they forced the. The new no party preference, which are the independent voters, uh, they they were supposed to be able to ask for a democratic uh, ballot, and they refused to give them to them. Gave them re- uh, provisional ballots that meant their votes didn't didn't count during the yes. el- election no, and was subject to higher talking. scrutiny. Uh, yeah, this is this is ma- This was a major major decision. It's real and we have a, we have a democrat. We have a democratic, um, you know, secretary of state here. And for this to happen, where they were all trained to give them provisional trained ballots. by Bush, I guess. You know, I still believe that we need to pressure and threaten to never vote for a Democrat again, and tell them we would never vote for them if they do not vote with their state. I think that my I can guarantee you, from threatening to not vote for your elected official will get will get some action on the Bernie yeah. side. Oh, well, you don't know, R. We've got we've got Daryl Issa um, here. Oh, well, he's a Republican, but I'm talking about yeah. the super delegates. I'm saying, look up your super delegates in your state. Go online and call them all. Most of them are elected officials, and a lot of those elected officials, you can say, "Hey, I am never going to vote for you if you do not vote with our state." We unanimously, or almost unanimously, yeah. Well, we also have Senator Feinstein, and uh, you know, uh, she. You know what? I think you still ought to call. And put, if she got millions yeah, she, of dollars, I mean, she's she's. I mean, it, it's a, it's a waste of time and energy with her. It really. Well, I it, I that's like uh, you know what I still believe we ought to poke him in the eye. That's well, I think I think, I think you know if, if you have uh, if you have senators, Donna, that I, you I think, have to stop this because we have thirty seconds left, and I want to say yeah. goodbye to you properly. <laughs> Thank All right. you, Donna Gilmore, for joining us for this really lively and informative, really informative interview. I hope you join us again. Please do go to her website, SantaNoFreeSafety dot org. Uh, I really appreciate you being here with us, Donna. And okay, thanks. Thank you. And put your courage feet on, everybody. Take action. And if you're a Democrat, call your super delegate because we could still win it. Put your courage feet on, you guys. We need it.